Well, welcome back to class, everyone. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that so far you are learning quite a bit this semester in this class about all these different counseling approaches and counseling theories that we draw from every day as helpers when we're out there in the field working with other people as case managers, as therapists, as advocates, as social workers, whatever it is we're doing. All these different helping approaches that we're talking about and all the tools that they give us as we deal with people and help them to learn to understand themselves better and deal with whatever issue it is that they are dealing with at that time in their lives. So we come now this week to module number eight, our second week talking about this interesting helping approach called Gestalt therapy. And again, as I said last week in our little mini lecture, I like Gestalt therapy. It's a very interesting approach to me. Um, it's not always easy to understand. It's got all kinds of different little ideas. In some ways, it is the opposite in some ways of the person-centered approach we talked about with Carl Rogers a couple of modules back. Uh, but it is humanistic in nature. And so, uh, as I said last week, Gestalt therapy is really kind of a hybrid approach. Fritz Perls, who developed this um, approach many, many years ago, really was sort of trained in Freudian psycho psychoanalysis. And he kind of borrowed some of those ideas, but he really was more of a humanist and existentialist in many, many ways, but not the passive, easygoing, you know, more the confrontational, more the energetic, more the supportive, you know, more the active and energetic way of applying some of the humanistic ideas that we've talked about. So the word gestalt is a word that means the whole. And we talked last week that one of the things that gestalt therapy, one of the, one of the main things that gestalt therapy is really sort of known for gestalt theory was Pearls's focus on this idea of mind, body, spirit, the mind, body, spirit connection. And that he was really one of the first theorists to kind of put in this idea that even though we have a body, our body and our physical body is connected to our emotional body, so to speak. And that our emotional body is connected to the spiritual part of us. And we are one whole person made up of three separate parts. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the body here in just a second. Because in this module, we want to talk about some key approaches that we see sometimes that we can draw from, from the core ideas of Gestalt therapy as we work with people. Now, again, I want to kind of go back to the very, very beginning if I can. One of the things that I highlighted for you last week, and I want to highlight again here because it'll make sense as we go through and talk about the uh, two or three really core ideas that I summarized for you in your lecture notes, is this. Um, gestalt therapy uh, is a therapy that believes that even though as, as, as sort of an existential approach, even though we have the capacity to learn and to grow, even though we have resources in addition to limitations and all of that humanistic stuff, uh, this theory sort of teaches that naturally, though, we're immature. That's a key idea. This theory sort of teaches that as men, in, that most of us as men and women, we naturally move away from our problems. We don't want to deal with them. We naturally make excuses for our problems. We don't want to be responsible. Even though we are responsible, we don't want to be responsible. Uh, Pearls was a believer. The author of your textbook talks about how Pearls was kind of a believer that generally most people are kind of immature. You can be 50-something years old, 60-something years old, but psychologically, emotionally, many of us are still kids. And that part of what we need to do is learn to grow up. We need to learn to kind of get, we need to learn to kind of grow up a little bit, realize that the life, the world we live in is not always fair. That's okay. And we just need to take responsibility for ourselves and get going. That's kind of the way he counseled people, right? So this idea that we naturally move away from responsibility, we're naturally by our nature, oftentimes em emotionally and psychologically immature. And this idea that even though we have the capacity for self-awareness, we often choose to be, it's a key word, we often choose to be unaware. We are, we have the capacity to be aware, but we just don't want to look at stuff. So we just don't deal with it. And it's just easy for us to be kind of lazy. Lazy is a good word that pearls love the word lazy. He would say, no offense. He's, he would say, even if he, if he was alive today, he would say, Hey, even in my own life, I'm lazy sometimes. And in working with my clients, guys be blunt. A lot of times there's lazy. They want stuff to be easy. They want stuff to work out the way they, they want all, they want, they want a bunch of answers to all their questions. They don't want to take any risks. They want everything to be safe because they're lazy and kind of immature. That sounds terrible. That's kind of, that was kind of his belief of, of human nature in a way. I want to mention and kind of review that with you. I mentioned some of that last week because that will make a lot more sense. This lecture will make a lot more sense if you kind of keep that in the context of, of the idea of kind of what we're going to see with, uh, with, these, with these gestalt ideas. 
First idea I want to give to you is this. I actually listed for you last in your lecture notes, but I'm going to start with the first. I remember the first time I was introduced to Gestalt therapy and theory as a graduate student. And I just remember the word confrontation. That's how I that's how I remembered Gestalt. Gestalt equals con it, it means the whole, but I just remember this was an approach that sort of promoted the need that as helpers sometimes, part of what our job is, is to hold up a mirror in front of the client and say, hey, look at this. You don't want to look at this, but you need to look at this. And part of our part of how we do that was through what's called verbal confrontation. Now let's talk about that for a second. I put this in your notes this week. Confrontation does not mean, does not mean getting up in the client's face. That is not confrontation. Confrontation does not mean arguing. It doesn't mean putting down. It doesn't mean, oh yeah, we, that's not confrontation. Confrontation as a clinical skill is basically holding a mirror up in front of the client to say, hey, hey, look at this. Here's what I see as, as, your, as your therapist, as your friend. Let me show you what I see in good ways and maybe not so good ways. It's both. Conference, sometimes we, we don't think about that, but sometimes confrontation has to be used to help people to see good things. I'm always putting myself down. I'm always talking about how I can't do anything. And sometimes as helpers, we have to say, you know what? Is it possible that you really are good at a lot of stuff? You got a lot of stuff. Figured. That doesn't seem like confront. That seems like an encouragement. But confrontation is where we sort of challenge someone. The word challenge and the word confrontation kind of mean the same thing in counseling settings. It's where we verbally challenge the client to look at something or to consider something they don't want to look at or want to consider. So confrontation, sort of that direct approach of kind of holding up a mirror in front of the client is a very core practice when it comes to gestalt therapy. So if that's kind of your personality, or if you're wanting to go forward and work like in drug and alcohol counseling, where we use a lot of that kind of direct approach, you may kind of like Gestalt therapy and Gestalt theory, right? So again, confrontation is not tearing someone down. It's not making someone cry. It's not breaking their spirit. It's, again, it is it, the idea of challenging someone to look at something or to consider something that it's hard for them to look at and to consider. And again, I like the metaphor that, that comes from Gestalt, the idea of holding up a mirror Hey client, here's what let me show you. Let me show you what I'm seeing. Let me show you what I'm hearing. You don't want to look at this, but part of my role is to sort of not make you, but challenge you to look at this situation. So the idea of confrontation is a key idea when it comes to gestalt therapy. Let me give you some examples of some ways that we might use confrontation. Number one, what's called focus on the body. Maybe you've heard of this. Um, one of the things that that gestalt therapy sort of teaches us is that when we're listening to our clients that we communicate just as much non-verbally as we do verbally. And because we are mind, body, spirit, that a hand gesture like this. So imagine I'm your client. I'm in, I'm in a group you're leading. As I'm talking about my boss, I'll st I start doing this with my hand. And I'm talking, but I'm also doing this. I'm, I don't know. I'm pointing my finger. I'm like, oh, whatever, right? Well, a gestalt therapist is going to listen to my words as much as he's going to see. He or she is going to see this as communication. This is just as loud as me speaking or if someone sort of rolls their eyes or shakes their head or puts their head, all this nonverbal, the idea that verbal behavior and nonverbal behavior are equal. And that, 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 that's an idea that for those of you who are going to go forward in your clinical training and you go, if you go to graduate school or go get your degree in social work or whatever, and you do some more intensive counseling training or you do a clinical internship, you'll learn. And that's one of the things I learned in my clinical training was how to listen to people with my ears and my eyes and to, and to notice body language and to notice when a client broke eye contact with me and to notice when their jaw would clench up and to notice when they would sort of start talking. Like I remember I had a client one time and every time she would get upset with me, she would say, you know what? I don't like you asking me. She'd take her hand. She'd wave it at me. You know what, Glenn? I don't like you asking me about that. She would do that little thing. Uh, now here's the thing. The idea is a lot of times, People are not aware they're doing that. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not sure if you've ever, have you, has anyone ever drawn your attention to a little body body language thing you do and you don't even know where you're doing it? So Gestalt therapy would pay, a therapist would pay attention to the wave and would say, and, and might even draw attention to it and might say to the client, you know, this may not be a big thing, but I noticed every time I ask you about blank and you don't want to talk about it, you kind of wave at me. Put your hand, I, I would say, put your hand up. Let's kind of like that. So what is that? What are you trying to say to me? And clients may say, oh, I'm not saying anything. Well, this three would say, yeah, you are. You're saying, you're communicating to me on two levels, verbally and your body's talking to me, 
right? What's, what's that about? And so you, you, you explore and you explore the idea of what, what are these body language, you know, these body language, nonverbal kinds of things kind of mean. Now, again, you don't want to put people on the spot and make them nervous about how they talk. But at the same time, the idea of focusing on the body, again, like I said earlier, facial expressions, noticing when clients look away. Um, one of the things we talk about in the group dynamics class is when you're facilitating a group is, is sort of noticing people's reactions to one another and noticing when people physically begin to get uncomfortable or when people begin to, you know, a lot of that people get frustrated and go, and one of the things I learned as a group facilitator is I would listen for that. So a lady's over here talking, ladies over here talking, I've got my attention on her, but out of my right ear, here's a guy over here, a fellow group member who goes, right? So I would find a way to turn my attention to him and say, hey, man, what's going on? You all right? You sound like you're a little frustrated. Talk to us about it. It's a nonverbal. It's just a, it's, it's a, he's not saying anything out loud. It's, 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 it's more of a sound, but it's, and he may even be aware he's doing it. A lot of times it's unconscious. But this theory sort of promotes the idea that that body we, we we speak through our body language as much as we do through our verbal language because mind body spirit right so this idea of focusing on the body related to that is focusing on language now this is another one of those deeper kind of a counseling things and the longer you work with people you'll become more skilled at this one of the things I try to do as best I can it's part of active listening is sometimes I listen to not only um, what people talk about, but I listen to how they talk about it. And that's a little bit more of a deeper counseling skill. So it's not, it's not a matter of listening to what is being said. It's also listening to how it is being said and paying attention to language. Because again, uh, this theory says that a lot of times part of what happens is we communicate how we really feel through the kind of language that we use. And also this idea, which I list in your in your lecture notes, Pearls was kind of a believer, was a believer that sometimes in sneaky ways, we use language to distance ourselves from our problems. That's an interesting idea. I'm not sure if you ever thought about that. We sometimes use language to distance ourselves from our problems and to stay right where we are. And so we sometimes listen to people's language. So for example, I give you I gave you three or four examples of how that could look in your lecture notes. We talk about what's called you talk. Y-O-U, we talk about it talk, uh, middle of the road language and metaphors. So for example, uh, you talk, and again, the idea with language with from a Gestalt perspective is sometimes we use language without realizing it to stay where we are, it needs to be confronted. So for example, if I was your client, I would say, you know, you just can't talk to women. You just can't talk, you know, you know how women are. You, you just can't talk to women. That would be called what's called you talk. And if you were my therapist and you were a Gestalt therapist, you might challenge me to think about how I talk about, how, how I talk about women. And you might challenge me to say, Glenn, is, is, would you be willing to restate that instead of saying, you just can't talk to women? Would you be willing to restate it and say, I can't talk to women and personalize it? Because by saying, you know, you just can't talk to women, that's, that's a vague statement. It's my way of disconnecting myself from my situation. But if I say, hey, I can't talk to women, well, that's personal. And a lot of times that's part with, with it language and you language, we often challenge people to make it personal. Hey, instead of saying it's hard, why don't you say it's hard for me? Right. And so you, you get people, you challenge people to make their conversations per, instead of this vague, broad, middle of the road. Yeah, I don't know. I could. I might. Well, why don't you say yes or no? You know, instead of this broad, vague kind of language. The other thing I love about Gestalt, I remember I remember when this is one of the first things that stuck with me with about Gestalt therapy is metaphors. And if you ever watch any old videos of Fritz Pearls, Pearls would listen for clients using figures of speech. So he would listen for his clients who would say, yeah, it's like beating my head against a brick wall. That's a metaphor. Not, you're not literally beating your head against a wall, but it's just a figure of speech. That means I'm frustrated. You know, I just paint myself in a corner over and over again. That's just a figure of speech, right? I paint myself in a corner means I, I make bad decisions and then I kind of screwed, right? Um, you know, it's like, it's like an uphill battle at work. It's like an uphill battle. Well, the, the client is not literally walking uphill at work. It's a figure of speech. But Gestalt therapy suggests, you know what, maybe that's a way to get clients thinking about solutions is to say, in other words, you would take the metaphor literally. 
And you would say, so a client who says, if I said to you, you know, my, my problem is I paint myself in a corner all the time. You might ask me a question like, sorry, are you in the corner now? Are you in a, do you feel like you're in a corner now? You take, you take my language, my metaphor, and you use it. Do you feel like you're in a corner now? Yeah. So like, how tight is that corner? So you've painted yourself into a corner. How could you, so you kind of go with it. So how, how, so how, when you're, when you're painting yourself into a corner, how do you get out of a corner? How do you do that? Well, you know, I don't know. You have to wait till the paint dries. Okay. So what would that be for you? Waiting, right? Or something like that, right? It's like being a big, it's like, it's like an uphill battle at work. Okay. So this uphill battle, there's people fighting you, right? The word battle means fight. So who's fighting you? How are they fighting you? What kind of weapons are they using? So you just take, you just kind of, you take it as literal. I mean, again, you just sort of use it, just going with it. An uphill battle, you know, the word battle means someone's fighting against you. So how big is that army? I'd probably say, so how big is that army? Oh man, it's like everybody in my office. Well, that's on that side. What about on your side? Who's on your army? It's just me. Wow. Okay. So it's just you. That is an uphill battle. You, an army of one fighting an army of 25. What kind of weapons do they use? What kind of weapons do you use? That doesn't seem fair. One versus 25. Maybe you need someone, some help to get some, you need to recruit some people to help you to get on your side of the battle. Right. So you kind of, so, so the idea is you kind of, with a metaphor, you sort of take it as literal and you kind of go with it. Right. So again, um, gestalt therapy. So kind of this idea of like focusing on the body, focusing on language. I gave you some information about that in your lecture notes. And then the last thing with gestalt therapy is, and this is again, an idea that we borrow, we use all the time was pearls was a believer in what's called experiments, counseling experiments. And that can look a bunch of different ways, but Fritz Pearls is one of the very, very first people who used in counseling what we call role play, which we do all the time today. He would use role play. So as he's talking to a client, a client is talking about how I can't talk to my wife. He would, say to the, he would say to the client, well, imagine I'm your wife and you're you. I want you to talk to me right now how you talk to her normally. Or let me be your wife. You be your wife. I'm going to be you. And when you say you can't talk to her, that she kind of just gets all upset. Well, show me how she gets upset. I'm going to be you. Hey, honey, how you doing? Right. How does she respond? Show me. And so it's a little bit more you know, exper experiential. It's an experiment. Instead of just talking about it, show me. You know, um, what about, so you want, you're, you're wanting to go in and talk to your boss about a raise. Okay. Well, imagine I'm your boss and you're you. Let's just kind of practice. How do you want that to go? What are you going to say to him? How, 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 how do you, how do you think your boss is going to respond? Well, he's going to roll his eyes at me. Well, here in a second, I, as you're talking to me, I'm going to roll my eyes at you like your boss. I want you to, how are you going to handle that? I want you to practice a way to handle that. So you roll, you practice and you role play. So gestalt kind of gestalt therapy is, is, is kind of centered a lot of times in experiments. Another common one was called the empty chair technique. And again, that's part of what one of the things that made gestalt therapy famous was this empty chair experiment, real simple. And usually with an empty chair, you usually, you would, you would ask the client to practice a conversation with an empty chair. Um, maybe it's someone who's passed away who I wish I could talk to. And Pearls would say, well, you know what? Well, let's just use our imagination. So where's an empty chair? I want you to imagine that your dad is sitting right there. What would you say to him if you could today? He's not here. I understand. But let's just let's let's imagine that he was. And what would you hope to hear? What's he saying back to you? What do you want him to say back to you? Maybe situation with my ex-wife or my daughter or my son or whatever. Well, you know what? They're not here. But, you know, imagine that they were here. What would you say if they were here? Let's just sort of. And so and so, again, seems unusual, but Pearls would have like this session with this empty chair and his client talking this, as a way to get the client more connected to how they were feeling, how they were thinking, what they want to do as a way to kind of process of instead of saying, well, I, I can't talk to my dad because he's dead. OK, well, imagine he was alive. Let's talk to him. Right. Instead of someone just kind of staying stuck. Well, I don't know. There's all these things I want to say, but I can't do that now. Kind of that kind of passive. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. Well, let's do something. Right. What, what can we do? Let's do something. So it's more like an action oriented kind of a counseling. Right. So gestalt therapy is based in confrontation. This idea of holding a, a, a mirror up to the client. We confront the body. We confront language. We use experiments 
to kind of raise people's awareness, to kind of get them out of the middle of the road, kind of get them moving a little bit, um, more action oriented as opposed to just talking all the time, more physical behavior, more emotional experience, right? So it's all of that kind of good stuff. And even today, especially like in substance abuse counseling, working with teenagers, especially working with really highly resistant clients, you know, a lot of uh, gestalt therapy has kind of given us all kinds of ideas, a lot of holistic kind of a counseling, mind, body, spirit kind of idea, lots of, um, you know, more holism as far as our work with our clients is, 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 is sort of an idea in a way that kind of comes out of gestalt therapy in many, 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 many ways. So look at your lecture notes, read the textbook information, do your discussion question, do your homework. Interesting, interesting theory called gestalt therapy. And I will see you next time. All right.